This is The Premise, and I'm your host, Chad Thompson. Chad Thompson's the host. I'm the host. (laughs) I'm Jennifer Thompson. And I'm Chad Thompson, the host. (laughs) Here on The Premise, we get to the story behind the storyteller. Today, we talk to Lee Wind, the Director of Marketing and Programming at IBPA, He's also an author, a father, a husband, and an educator. His personal mission is to write the books that he needed to read when he was a young man. So let's jump right in. Let's jump right in. One of the first things I heard about you when we first met, I actually saw you speaking at a conference, a writer's conference, and you were talking about how you had a book that had been picked up for publishing and that publishing deal fell through. Hmm. And I want to talk about that, if you don't mind. Sure, no. But let's just rip right into my we're pain. We're going to rip right into the pain. <laughs> well, and I'm going to be real honest. Like, for me, it was poignant because I found myself in tears while you were telling the story because it said so much about everything that's happening in our country, but also just as a, a creative to have something that you've been working on and been so passionate about for so long and then be told that you're almost there and then have that taken away from you. I just can't think of a sadder story for a storyteller. Mm. Um, it sucked. <laughs> yeah. So give us some background. Okay. Yeah. So, so people so, know what we're talking about. So I, I'm, I'm, we're going to go way back. I feel Let's like do it. we need, we need Let's kind of crazy music. Like, yeah. So we have a way back machine. We can do that. We can make like kind of like totally. a, a theremin kind of. Like. We have a theremin. Of course Chad, you do. Chad, will you go get the theremin? <laughs> We're going to need some music. All right. Now, can I just patch that in later? You yeah, can totally absolutely. patch it in This later. is the, the magic of editing. <laughs> so I'm gay and I didn't come out until I was in my 20s. And while I was in high school and while I was in college and while I was in grad school, I dated girls. And... My parents were immigrants and they sort of brought their homophobia with them. And I sort of judged that it was the right thing to do. But I never felt what I knew I was supposed to feel when I was dating these girls. And I just felt guilty, but I also felt like it was keeping me safe. You felt guilty that you were dating women that you weren't really yeah, interested Yeah, because I didn't in? feel it. I mean, I, yeah. knew, I knew I didn't feel it, but yeah. so I just, I was a, like, I just basically lied from 11 to 25. Like, right. And that was very, very hard, and I was struggled a lot with with it. So, um, but I kept I I kept thinking about it's. I judged it the right thing to do. I didn't feel it. Mm-hmm. So then I finally got honest with myself and with others. And um, in 2011, I went to a talk. Uh, it was sort of a gay men's summer camp weekend thing and they had classes and I went to a class and this guy Randy Harrison not the actor that worked on Queer as Folk a different Randy Harrison okay spoke and he talked about the letters that Abraham Lincoln wrote Joshua Fry Speed and he said that he was convinced that Abraham was in love with Joshua and I was completely gobsmacked I was like right. how, how could that be true I'd never heard of this uh, it just but I couldn't get it out of my mind so I went to the library and I got out a book of the letters, and um, actually it was a book that the appendix was just the letters between Abraham and Joshua. And um, there's, Abraham and Joshua had lived together for four years in Springfield, Illinois. They shared a bed. Um, Historians at the time said that that was very common on the frontier. Springfield wasn't exactly the frontier, we'll put that aside, it doesn't really matter. But um, after they lived together for four years, uh, Joshua moves back to Kentucky and marries this woman named Fanny. And eight months later, Abraham sends him a letter and uh, he says, but now let me get to the part of the letter that is, I, I'm writing this for. Are you now in judgment? No, sorry. Are you now in feeling as well as judgment? Glad that you're married as you are. Mm. From anybody but me, this would be an impudent question not to be tolerated, but I know you'll tolerate it from me. Please tell me quickly. I feel very impatient to know. Wow. And I got goosebumps. Seriously. Because that was exactly how I felt. Right? right. I judged it, but I didn't feel it. And clearly, Joshua judged it, but didn't feel it. And then I thought, oh my gosh, maybe Abraham judged it. with Because we don't have the response, but we know it was only four weeks later that Abraham married Mary Todd. Mm. So I was like, well, maybe Abraham judged it, but didn't feel it. And then I, then my mind just started to explode. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was started reading every letter and I was super, super into it. And I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, if I had a time machine, mm-hmm. I could go back and tell my 11 year old self or my 13 year old self or my 15 year old self, like, hey, Abraham Lincoln was probably this guy in love with another guy. 
it would have changed the whole course of my life. Right. I don't have a time machine, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, but I'm a writer, and I thought, well, I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to write that story. The book that you wish you'd had. Exactly. The book that would have changed my life had right. I read it when I was a kid. And yeah. in fact, that's I have that over my desk uh, where I write. It, it says, my mission is to write the books that would have changed my life had I read them when I was a kid. Oh, that's wonderful. So, uh, and th there was nothing. You should put that on your up. website. <laughs> Say it again more slowly. Uh, my mission is to write the books that would have changed changed my life if I had read them when I was a teen. That is wonderful. Well, a kid or teen, I think. Sure. Yeah, because we're we're at a time where we're, we're becoming who we're going to be. Yeah. You know, that, yeah, wow. So so that that was sort of the spark. And I, I, I started writing this novel about this closeted teenage boy that lives in a small town in Lincolnville, Oregon, uh, that's super homophobic and he can't come out and he's inadvertently dating his best friend, this girl named Mackenzie. And he's in the exact situation I was in. Like he judges it, but he doesn't feel it. And then he stumbled, he's assigned a book report on Lincoln and he stumbles upon the same letter I did. And he has the same goosebump moment. Cool. And that's sort of the starting point of the book. And, and this then, is the book. This is, this is in the novel. It's called Queer is a $5 Bill. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, um, you know, because he thinks that he's going to change the world. He's going to use this as a lever to change the world. If right. he lets everyone in the world know that Abraham Lincoln was in love with another guy, people won't be able to be their homophobic selves because everyone loves Abraham Lincoln in our right. country, right? right? Like, I mean, he's on Mount Rushmore. He's on the penny. He's on the $5 bill. <laughs> so, like, it would change how everybody feels about gay people. You know, cue the rainbow and the happy ending and the singing birds. Boom. Right. Boom. He's done. Um, it would be a very short book if that's what happened. Um, so, right. <laughs> and I think in the real world, if it did, if somebody did that, if, if you, if, even if I could get this to go viral um, in some way, it would just be just gigantic conservative backlash and media firestorm. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what I have the character face. And then where it got really interesting was that there's, um, they, they're, the, his parents own the Lincoln Slept Here Bed and Breakfast. So I try to really make it, why is it important for a teen? Uh, why is Lincoln important for a teen today? Um, so it's sort of their livelihoods at stake because the, the town is losing all their income because they're a, a tourist economy as it gets more and more viral that they, this, he said this, that Lincoln was gay. And then they bring in a civil rights attorney to help them and she is an openly gay son. And, and um, she's African-American, says so the son. So sparks, sparks sort of fly between the two boys. And, um, but Wyatt's it, the main character is in this sort of quandary because he can't, he can't come out and have anybody still believe him about Lincoln. Hmm. Because a gay kid saying Lincoln's gay is very different than a straight kid saying right. Lincoln's gay. Interesting, yeah. So he has to decide, is he gonna sort of follow his heart and see if there's something with this guy that he likes, Martin, or is he going, but if he does, then this secret from history is just gonna fade back into nothing. Hmm. Or is he going to deny himself and try to change the world? Mm. So that's really the crux so of that's the, the, crux the of novel. The book. But when I was researching the novel and um, I just, more and more and more evidence came up about Abraham and Joshua. And I just kept thinking, well, it's, I'm trying to write a novel. I'm trying to write this modern story. I don't want to, I don't want to, I can't shove it all in. And then I thought, well, maybe there's a nonfiction book. Hmm. But I was not a big history student. I was going to ask I, you no, I what hate, your interest in history was. Not at all. Really? I mean, like, it was just like lists of names and dates to memorize. Totally right. And yeah. completely boring. And never anybody like me. I really thought I was the only gay person in the world mm. and didn't have a vocabulary for it. Mm -hmm. The irony is my older brother is gay, too, but neither oh, of really? us knew. We never spoke about it. Wow. Huh. Yeah, How so much older than you is he? Five and a half years. Okay, so, so he's quite um, a bit older. Quite a bit. But yeah, I mean, like, it was, I, I felt very isolated and mm -hmm. very alone. And, um, and, and tell us scared. where you grew up, too. Uh, right outside Philadelphia. And, and, okay. And on the main line. So um, I started doing this. I, I, the thing that's so exciting about this, getting people to know the story of Abraham and Joshua, is that it is a crack in the facade of history as mm -hmm. we teach it. So... Even we have a, my husband and I, we have a teenage daughter and, and her history textbooks year after year are the same ones that basically I had. That we had when we were kids. And it's the story, it says that history is the stories of rich, white, straight, cisgendered, able-bodied men from Europe. And maybe the teacher supplements with some information about Mm -hmm. Oh, there was there was a woman once that did something important, right. or who was, was married one, to one of these great men. There was once a person of color. Yeah, um, but it's very frustrating, and sure. and I think that once you can 
show, bam, there was a hole in that facade. And like, look, Abraham Lincoln was in love with Maybe this other Mike guy. Maybe we can bring it down. Yeah, and then suddenly yeah. the stories of Eleanor Roosevelt and Lorena Hickok, the mm-hmm. stories of Hatshepsut, this pharaoh that changed their gender over 22 years. And now all Egypt. of a sudden history is interesting. Yeah, it's history right? is, and history blossoms. And, and the, the craziest thing about history is that when I started getting into it beyond Abraham and Joshua, I, so Mahatma Gandhi, had, the the soulmate of his life was not his wife Kasturba. It was this German Jewish architect named Hermann Kallenbach that he met in South Africa, which I'd never heard of. Mm-hmm. But it, w- this Joseph Lelyveld is this Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, and he wrote a biography of Gandhi called Great Soul. And in it, there's like two pages where he talks about Gandhi's relationship with Hermann and talks about how they were really soulmates. And because of that, the book was banned in one of the states of India. And because of that, it landed in the New York Times. And because of that, I read it. And I was like, aha. (laughs) So like the silver lining of Manning. Um, But those letters between Herman Kallenbach and Gandhi uh, back and forth, there are like 200 of them. Mm. So I read them all um, because... uh, I, I was super, I just was so fascinated. I mean, I went from couldn't care less about history to like, give me more. Yeah, I need There's, more of this. There yeah. are these queer stories that are really empowering and I felt so empowered. So anyway, I'm reading it. You're not alone anymore, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I want to give that sense of not being alone to kids today. Right. Because it, it's important, not just for the queer kids, but for everybody to know Absolutely. that history includes these other stories. Right. So I so I was reading letters and I had this kind of crazy epiphany, which was that I kept thinking that these people in history were great and then footnote, oh, they were a man who loved another man or they were a woman who loved another woman or they were a person who lived outside gender boundaries. But reading those letters back and forth between Gandhi and, and Herman Kallenbach, I thought... Gandhi was the guy that had this insight into like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you pray left facing left and I pray facing right, we're all praying to the same God. And that was a pretty gigantic breakthrough in mm. sort of, I don't know, human evolution. Right. And I thought, well, the fact that he was in love with this Jewish guy from Germany who ended up getting arrested when he went, they went to England together um, with, with Kasturba. And, and because he was a German national, he was imprisoned in England. And he actually had a photograph of himself and Gandhi um, uh, and the Gandhi's secretary at the time um, folded into thirds and hid it in the collar of his shirt mm. uh, for years while he was imprisoned during the war. And it was just I just thought maybe maybe these people weren't great despite their being queer, but maybe they were great in some part because of it. Right, because of the hardships maybe that they faced and, and the and different the, challenges. And the insights they had and the compassion that maybe that brought about because Ooh, yeah. knowing that they were different too. Gotcha. And maybe they gave them insight. Like why was Eleanor Roosevelt the, you know, the woman that after her husband died and she became this sort of ambassador to the UN and she was the one that pushed through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Like she was in charge of that whole thing, which was huge, but she was in love with Lorena Hickok like that. And she had lesbian friends like this is really, this gives us a chance for history stories to open up like flowers. And right. and suddenly this this facade that we were teaching just crumbles mm-hmm. and all this amazing light from this history. This is really scary through. for a lot of people. Yeah, it's really exciting. And, and yes, and for I think the- scary for a lot of people. So there were two books. One was the fiction book and mm-hmm. the other was a nonfiction book that was... Um, so you all, wrote them both at the stories. same time. I, I did. I, well, I wrote the fiction book and then I did a proposal for the nonfiction book. Yeah. And uh, the nonfiction book was called um, The Queer History Project, No Way. They Were Gay. Right. And, um, and so the nonfiction book sold to one of the major publishers, Rhymes with Byman and Booster. Um, <laughs> Right, I don't want to say their name. That would be that would be awkward. But um, <laughs> we don't want to be awkward. Right, no. Simon <laughs> and Schuster, um, and um, yeah, it sold in 2014, and that was really exciting. It was going to be my debut book, mm-hmm. and um, I worked with them. You know, I wrote the whole thing because you sell it on with like the intro and a couple of chapters, and. Um, I was super, super excited. So you had a contract in place. Oh, I got paid. I got an advance. Um, yeah, wow. it was all happening. And uh, I, the book was, uh, I finished it. It was approved. 
uh, it was going to copy editing. They were sending me cover designs. And then you had a pub date. I had a pub. Well, yeah, yeah, I had a pub date. And then um, our current president was elected. And two weeks later, I get a phone call. It was canceled. Yeah, that they f- totally freaked out. They absolutely <laughs> couldn't publish it. Um, wow. Yeah, so that sucked. Um, it was very, very demoralizing and and frustrating. And I had an agent at the time who said, "Well, don't worry. We'll, we're you know, it's so strong. We'll we'll get it picked up." But months went by, and eight months went by, and nobody picked it up. And the novel at that point, um, I had revised it eight times, and um, the last time was actually um, I went to the Highlights Foundation, which is this amazing, um, amazing creative retreat um and i had mt anderson was my mentor and we he helped me do the final r- revision of the novel awesome so he was my editor so that was pretty amazing yeah um so i felt really strongly about the novel um but but n- they neither of them were getting picked up and nobody i mean nobody would pick up you know nobody would say yes um, you'd think that in in this day and age that people would kind of court that controversy right because you yeah. think that would just drive sales i i, I think it would have driven sales <laughs> i it just I, i'm still baffled why it happened but um but clearly they weren't the right home for it right. And, right. and um i think you know that the the culture shifted that there was a sense of fear and mm-hmm. um i don't know if they imagined cbs would be picketed i, I don't really know uh, what their what they imagined the tragedies that would ensue or who would be blamed, but it was very, very sad. And fear-based. Yeah, yeah totally fear-based. And and totally not, clearly not the right place for it. Mm-hmm. But nobody else would raise their hand and say, yes, we'll, we'll give do you it. a place. Yeah. So I was, you know, and I've been blogging for 12 years now. Um, I have a blog for, uh, for kids and for, uh, for teens and also for adults that care about LGBTQ teens. It's called, I'm here, I'm queer. What the hell do I read? And I've been doing it for a long time and it's done pretty well. We just passed like 2.7 million page loads and, um, it gets a lot of traffic. It gets a lot of attention because of that. I was asked to blog for the society of children's book writers and illustrators. So I have an audience that already cares about what I'm doing. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll crowdfund the book. Um, and I kind of looked at the two books and I thought, well, the novel's more of a page turner. It's mm-hmm. a little bit more, um, I, I'll serialize it on my blog and that way everybody can read it for free if they want to. But I wanted to do a professional, I started working at, at the Independent Book Publishers Association. Right. Which, which is how we met. Right, right. Um, IBPA. And I'm the director of marketing and programming there. And so a lot of my job is telling people, well, if you're going to publish yourself, you better do it in a way that it's indistinguishable in quality from something coming out from a major house. So that takes some money. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to raise the money um, through a uh, crowdfunding thing. But I didn't like the idea of it being like, help Lee publish Lee's book because Lee wants his book to be published. Because Lee wants to be published. Uh, It's terrible. Uh, (laughs) So I thought, well, my book is really this empowerment tool. It's Mm -hmm. all about empowering LGBTQ teens and their allies. So I thought, okay. And which book are we talking about? Sorry, this was the fiction book. Um, So the Queer is a $5 bill. So um, I... Uh, decided that I, I pulled a number out of thin air. I thought, well, 400 copies sounds like quite a bit. So I thought I would do a Kickstarter <laughs> to raise enough money to uh, professionally publish the book, but also give away 400 copies. Okay, so nice. So I did that um, uh, back in uh, January of 2018. Nice. And uh, it funded in six days, which was really nice. That's but pretty incredible. It went on for 30 days. So we ended up raising enough money to give away 910 copies. Ooh, that's awesome. And I teamed up with a nonprofit uh, to, because I don't know, 910 teens. Right. Um, and <laughs> so we I, stood on the street corner. And yes. so we had 910 given away. So um, so I teamed up with a nonprofit called Camp Brave Trails. They're sort of awesome. a, a, a leadership camp for LGBTQ and allied teens. So that was really cool. They're actually on the, the, lay, the logo was on the back of the book and um so it, that that sort of was really exciting and then there was one f- last twist to the story which is that the book I love twists oh, I, I don't <laughs> it was it was hard this one was hard oh no so, so uh, the book was coming out in October of uh, 2018 um but two months before that the agent that I had had was in revealed to in this giant scandal to have been lying to like over 60 of her clients about their submissions because they'd never been submitted the works oh had gosh. never been submitted she she made it up oh. she made oh. up she made up rejections she made up acceptances what? yeah it was this 
big thing in the world of children's literature. And um, and that was my agent. I'm really so, confused because they don't get paid unless they sell the book. Oh, it didn't make sense. It was sort of like, a, I mean, the only the only rational explanation I've ever heard was that it's sort of like Munchausen syndrome. Right. Like if you keep them, you know, the idea was that she was getting some emotional payoff by keeping us all like... Uh, on the cusp, like her little chicks. Uh, on the cusp of breaking <laughs> through, yeah. Wow! Like she had told me that I had um, two, two different pending book deals, but they and just, they were we lies. were just waiting. It was lies. They'd never even seen the manuscripts. That's yeah. incredible! What a bizarre. I'm so sorry. Yeah, and and so, so the, the the novel that I crowdfunded because I felt like I was being stonewalled by this industry. No one had ever seen it. Right. It had never been submitted anywhere. And oh. and the nonfiction I hadn't been, when when we got it back from Simon and Schuster, she never sent it out again. So, wow. So now I have a real agent who is not a criminal, which <laughs> I'm very happy about. As far as you know. <laughs> Honestly, no, 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 no. Marietta Zagger, she's awesome. She's, um, she is completely above board so, and really honest. And so we found, she found a new home for the nonfiction book, uh, which is awesome. It's so Lear, it's coming out learner, uh, in May, 2021. Fantastic. So that will, that will actually um, get out there. But in the meantime, the novel's out and, yeah. um, you know, who knows, maybe it'll get picked up, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But that was my crazy, crazy story. To it's a pretty crazy story, yeah. but I wonder if like this, this is kind of a good thing. First of all, it's, it's an interesting story. Mm. Right. Oh, yeah. so we get to tell it over and over again. <laughs> it's podcast worthy. Thank it's you totally both. podcast <laughs> sure. worthy. And and I think telling the story is healthy in a lot of different ways. You know, for creatives, but also for for someone who was like you and who felt like they were the only gay person. They were alone, and they you know someone that you can relate to, and like the hardship of that experience. I think has a lot of power in it. Mm. And then there's a happy ending too. I think. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the fact absolutely. that you know the crowdsourcing, you know, in six days, and then you you raised more, and you were able to give away 910 books. Like that's a pretty incredible story. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's funny how we adversity nobody wants adversity no, no, one, but it's no one's going to raise their hand for right. oh yes bring me some of that adversity but it <laughs> yeah. does shape us it I does. Mean, you know that the struggle that i had to be my authentic self is totally the motivation for trying to make our world a place where kids and teens can be their authentic selves now yeah and i feel really great about that mission but i wouldn't have that mission unless i had had the that experience. miserable Mm -hmm. time figuring it out for myself. Right. Yeah. So I wouldn't yeah. raise my hand for it, but I guess I'm not, I guess I'm okay with it at this point because it shaped me. Yeah. Like all our experiences. Do. Yeah. Well, and I think it's admirable too, that you, you've committed to helping others and telling your story and being really forthright about your story, I think is really healthy. It's healthy. I mean, that's why memoir is so popular right now, too, is like we want to hear these stories of other people who have gone through something that we feel like we're all alone. Memoir is fascinating to me. Um, I, so Barbara Kingsolver is an author I, I love really Barbara admire. Kingsolver, oh. yeah. So she, I think it was in um, Animal Vegetable Miracle that she gives this metaphor and she talks about the difference between fiction and nonfiction. She said that like fiction is like building a garden in the desert. So you have to bring everything there. There's nothing. You start with nothing. And then you have to bring dirt and you have to bring the seeds and you have to bring the That feels the really water. exhausting. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and you <laughs> have the sunshine water. and you have yeah. to tend it. And, and then eventually it will grow into a garden. Right. And she said, nonfiction is like walking into a jungle and like, you know, marking out the boundaries <laughs> of what's your garden and starting to take out everything that doesn't belong. Right. In the cutting garden. it all away. And cutting it that all away. just as exhausting. <laughs> yeah, I just threw my pen. Uh, cutting it all away until, <laughs> until you have the garden of your book. Um, and I think that there's such different processes. Totally. But I love that metaphor because it does feel that a little bit like that. Like mm -hmm. I just um, I just finished two uh, memoirs in the last week and because I'm, I'm super fascinated by it. And it's like the scenes you select are so, well, selective, right? Totally. Like you're, you're yeah. curating the, yeah. the story of your the life. Pieces of your life. And you have to be very thoughtful about why you do it. But also, I mean, that's true in fiction too. I mean, like uh, the new book I'm working on, it's like, what what is this scene? And mm -hmm. why does this scene need does to it be belong? in the book? Right. It, is this, does it move the story forward? Exactly. Does so, it keep me engaged? There's so many of those moments that don't move stories forward. It's right. like, okay, well, this does not belong here. So. Well, and it's interesting too, because when you're writing your memoir, you're really attached to these emotional experiences that for you have a lot of significance. And it, it really takes, I think, an outside editor to come in and say, you know what, this needs to be cut. 
I know it feels like you're cutting off a limb, but this needs to be cut in order for it to be a better book. Well, and it's also interesting that sort of the the magic, the transmutation of, Mm -hmm. okay, I felt this amazing emotional moment. How do I, am I, is it getting across on the page? Like mm-hmm. for me, like that was with Queers of $5 Bill, like the, oh, and by the way, it's $5 Bill because Lincoln's on the five, right? So I would, I would okay. like to think that everyone, <laughs> well, we actually want to talk to you a little bit about that, the $5 Bill. We want to go okay. there, but, but we can continue down this path. <laughs> um, uh, wait, and, and totally my train just went off on that path. But now I'm like, I know, oh, right now we're on a door. Like, ah. I think we've just jumped tracks. We did. We did. We totally just jumped tracks. I jumped it with you. Okay. I totally did. No, we were talking about memoir and getting oh. an editor. And I want to ask you about your yeah. process in working with an editor. So I'm going to guess that what you were about to say is that when you discovered that Lincoln potentially had a lover, right, you the had goosebump goosebumps. moment, right, right. When and you trying wrote to transfer that it. scene, mm-hmm. did you get goosebumps? Right, and and how hard it was to try to make sure that the the audience would at least know that the character had goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. I, I How do you I don't know if I got, that? I don't know if I got the readers to get goosebumps. I hope so, but um I, yeah, that was that was the hardest scene to write, but also that was the that was the genesis moment of the whole no- novel, right? Well, right there. Absolutely. So it's so in like the pacing of getting to that and like how how much time you spend in that scene is really important. Mm. The I first a, the first draft of the book started with that scene. And oh, I was like, oh, that totally doesn't work. No, you gotta you, you gotta <laughs> work up to that. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's like, wait a minute, that's the payout. That's yeah. The, <laughs> exactly. But it's like if you don't know who the character is, you don't care. It's like, you know, everybody wants their book to start out like a James Bond movie where he's like, you know, he's skydiving. You know, and that's very exciting. <laughs> right. But totally if you different don't know book. who they are, you don't care about them skydiving. <laughs> <laughs> so don't have them skydive on page one. Unless I guess, well, I guess they get away but with they, it in see, James Bond because in adventure novels you can totally do well, that. Read an adventure but memoir. It's usually, it's usually the end of the last of the last adventure, though, right? Like James Bond movies open up. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's, it's not the new adventure, right? He right. Hasn't, he hasn't gotten his assignment yet. So he ends. This is this. You're exactly right about that. He ends, and then it's like, oh, now he gets to relax. And then all of a sudden, something comes out of my right. film. Right, just like the Indiana Jones movies, just right. like. You know, it's the tail end of the previous adventure and it's like, mm-hmm. and you start off with excitement. Then you're like, there's the lull. Mm-hmm. And then here's. And go. Right. Yeah. Well, then that's always the challenge. Right? I think, I think with memoir even more, because I mean, very few of us have these exciting moments of jumping out of planes. Mm-hmm. where it, there's. So let me ask you a question. I'm totally jumping tracks again. So you read Educated. <laughs> you told me about it recently. Yeah, you yeah. really liked it. Mm. So when I first started that book. I was blown away by the beauty of her writing. Like that captured me. I was just there. I was swaying in the in that hayfield, you know, in the wind, and I could just totally picture the whole scene. And a lot of people think that that that's a bad way to start a book because it's so mon- it's not mundane, but but a lot of people are like, you don't want to go the poetic way, right? Mm. Like, how does that bring you in or make you care about the character? But for me, it really worked. And I'm curious how you felt about those op- that opening scene. I love that question. I was okay with it. It's, I'm, I'm a little bit more action-y mm-hmm. oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I would have been sucked into the book with a different opening choice. Mm-hmm. Um, but... It was very beautiful and very lyrical. It was lyrical. That's exactly right. Yeah. It was poetic. It was like dancing. And yet having completed the book, yeah, I feel like I understand the beginning more mm. because the character which she was at the beginning of the book could never have described that. with such beauty and lyricism mm-hmm. that opening moment. She needed to be educated. In order to write in order that. To, in order to have written that. So I think the opening makes more sense once you've finished the whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's almost like titles, right? Sure. Like, like that was my challenge with Queer as a $5 bill because the expression that it riffs off of Queer as a $3 bill. Yeah, we were going to go nobody, there. Yeah. Nobody knows, no kid today knows that. Really? So, huh. Yeah, it's it's an old timey expression. Is we're, it really? We're, we're kind of old. Mm. Yeah, we're getting old. Yeah. I mean, oh, sorry, but baby. But it's awesome. Hey, you know, <laughs> yeah, for, for them, it'll be something like uh, Queer as Dogecoin or some obscure <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just, but, they, they'd never heard of it. So I actually had to figure out, um, that was my, one of the big challenges. Like I had to figure out in chapter one, how, how, do, to I, explain it. how do I slip that in? Right. So they have the background and then it makes sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, and it's interesting. Chad and I were talking about this last night, how, you know, every culture has its like its lingo, like its language, which I think is kind of, you know, interesting that you tied that in, which I think is kind of brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we went there. We talked about the the the, the bandanas and, you know, like when you're in a, in a in, I guess, a subculture where, you know, you can't be really open about who you are, but you're still looking for each other. And so I think it's incredible how, you know, we as humans, we find a way to communicate and how to find our tribe and how to find each other anyway. Right. And, and then so much of it is about and how to do it while feeling safe. Yes. Right. And that was it. And that's, I think, what you were talking about last night, Chad. Yeah, you, f- you find a means by which to communicate with others within your tribe that people outside of that tribe don't recognize as a language. Mm. Mm-hmm. But the, the challenge with that is that it keeps you closeted. Right. So like- That's true. Um, so there was a biography of Abraham Lincoln that was written in 1926, uh, Carl Sandburg. And he talked about how um, Abraham Lincoln and Joshua Fry Speed, um, I think the quote goes something like, uh, had sp- their character had spots of lavender streaks of violet or something like that. Hmm. Um, and so it was coded language that only members of the gay community would understand because, um, you know, lavender was the sort of like coded um, color in, in terms of gay people finding each other. Hmm. And um, it, it was kind of crazy like to, to, to read that and to kind of D- dissect it, you know, bit by bit and be like, oh, wait a minute, mm. you know, um, spots soft as May violets, I think was the other part of that quote. Um, and violets were worn in the 1920s in England and the lapel of gentlemen that did not intend to marry or something like that. Interesting. Another one of those coded things. Yeah. Um, but so it was like he was telling people, but he wasn't telling the general public because he couldn't have gotten away with getting the right. book published if he just came out and say that, hey, these two guys loved each other. Right. So it's fascinating that it, it, I'm not, the, I'm, I'm not Indiana Jones, right? Like nobody chased, <laughs> that there was no giant boulder chasing me through, through <laughs> the God, library. Right? Stacks. <laughs> but but what's crazy is that this information is available. I mean, there have been tens of thousands of books published about Abraham Lincoln, mm-hmm. but there's only been one that ever actually came out and said that Lincoln was in love with other guys, and it was The Intimate Life of Abraham Lincoln. And what's crazy is that it really buys into this whole CSI history thing. Mm-hmm. So like so when you talk to when I when I talk to people and I tell them this story, a lot of the response I get was like, Well, can you prove they had sex? Really? And I'm like, wait. What? No. <laughs> no, wait. Why first would of all, I even why want would to do I, that? Yeah, exactly. Like, why Why do I have to be that prurient about it? And like, no, I don't have any DNA evidence that they had sex. But like, why Why are we even having that conversation? Right. Like, yeah. Because if you look at the primary source materials, you can see if they loved each other. Mm-hmm. And that's a way that more interesting question. Yeah, right? Right? Like, rather than like, oh, well, who did he, who shared whose bed and what do they do in that bed? Like, mm-hmm. I don't really care. And I don't want to be sex negative, but like, just really why... Like we're so we're so weird in our culture about sex. We're so puritanical. We're obsessed with it, but totally. we don't like we, we we pretend we don't like it, and it's not good or, or yeah. healthy. When it, of course it is a healthy thing, yeah. Um, as long as people are consenting, so it's kind of a crazy thing that we do in our culture about mm-hmm. sex. So I've I've started to talk a little bit about how our words maybe could be more thoughtful, like rather than if we talk about like homosexual history, I think that it just makes everyone that isn't on board kind of think, oh, well, gay people are the people that have sex in a way I don't. Mm. And if we talked about love rather than sex, if the word was homo lovable, <laughs> if we were, right? Like, I mean, you're laughing and I laugh at it too, but I think that, wow, what a different cultural yeah, conversation totally different. we'd have, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, today, we're gonna, so much power. today we're gonna study homo lovable history, right? Or we're gonna talk about homo lovable rights Mm -hmm. we'd have a very different cultural totally different conversation yeah because ultimately i mean at the end of the day the love that i have between me and my husband is the exact same love that i mean it's the same glue that that is in your relationship right i mean love is love and right and that's a good thing and we shouldn't be afraid of it yeah absolutely but it is funny how everybody's always like well can you prove it yeah that's interesting here read the letters (laughs) yeah you tell me what you think yeah, and and that's actually that's the whole premise of the of the nonfiction book is putting the primary source materials in front of kids and teens and saying, yeah, this is what I think. We that's know what the premise. Hundreds of years, yeah, hundreds of years <laughs> of historians have have 
skewed it and told it the way that they want you to think about it. But just put them aside and let's look at the letters. I'll tell you what I think, but what do you think? Yeah, let's have a conversation about yeah. it, right? Yeah. I think opening the conversation is really the first step and people being willing to talk about it is yeah. huge. And just acknowledging that there's a possibility. I mean, I actually feel like it's it's a scene I'm a little embarrassed. I feel like I've written it in a couple of different books in in a, in a in a with a similar thematic like moment mm -hmm. where the character is being confronted about discovering that someone in history is gay mm -hmm. and they're they're being told well how you can't just imagine everyone in history is gay. And the response is, well, why is it okay to assume everyone in history was straight? Well, yeah, when exactly. we know that was equally implausible, right? right? Like it's equally impossible for every single important person in history to have been heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's but my see, premise. <laughs> but that's the thing is we like want to fit ourselves into little boxes and we want to, you know. I, I grew do up. Do we? Do we want to fit ourselves no, into boxes? No, we don't. I think we do people, not. I don't think people. we do. But, but a lot of people do. It makes them feel comfortable and it makes them feel safe. Because mm -hmm. they can label it and that's they can what that it. is. And I know yeah. this because that's what it is. And that's what I've labeled it. But I also think there's a certain amount of fear of being, about, you know, the idea of being different. Mm. You know, we're not, I mean, <laughs> I mean, let's just, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, nationalism and tribalism and, you know, so much that's happening right now in this country that's so detrimental to all of our psyche, right? And I grew up in, a, in farm country in Northern Idaho. And when I, I remember moving to San Diego and seeing two men holding hands and I was like, oh, so uncomfortable, you know, because, because I didn't understand it and I didn't know it and I was told that it was bad. Mm. But I didn't actually believe that. You know, it, it took a very short amount of time before I had a lot of gay friends and I realized, yeah, we're all just people and we, we love each other, you know, and, the, and I think what you're talking about, you know, the language and how we talk about it makes a big difference in how we think about it and our takeaway, you know, two people love each other as opposed to two people having sex with each other. Yeah, we don't talk about how, you know, heterosexuals have sex. Oh, heterosexuals. Ridiculous. Let's reduce heterosexuals to the way they have sex. Yeah, that, can you imagine? That sounds refreshing, like, right? Like, that's just ridiculous on any plane. And yet, right. that's exactly what has been, yeah, been we, done to, to, to gay people. And... But I still, I still, you know, I have family who are uh, absolutely afraid of it. And I love having my nieces and nephews come to town and meet my gay friends. And they're like, oh, you know, being exposed to these things and understanding that, hey, maybe Lincoln was in love with a man. Oh, it's just, yeah. you know. Well, I think that that's the power of books, right? Because it is not the everybody power of books. gets to come and visit their aunt. In that's true, in San, San Diego. Diego. Yeah. So, like that's why it, I, it, it always baffles me as a parent. I'm always interested that people think that if they can protect their children from knowledge of things they don't want their children to be exposed to, they will keep their children safe from those things. Hmm. When I actually think it's the opposite. I think ignorance totally. is actually putting your child in danger. Like if you don't know how people get pregnant, Mm -hmm. you have a much better chance of getting, getting pregnant. pregnant. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and if you don't want your child to be pregnant. Yeah. Maybe teach that, them how that works. The, the, you know, the, the knowledge would be helpful, mm -hmm. right? Because that would keep your child safe from that eventual, from, from that outcome. Yeah. And um, I, I think that, that urge to sort of monitor what other people read, you know, again, like we were saying about the Joseph Lelyveld book, sometimes it, it, it helps that book get noticed, but just that the instinct behind it is so crazy making, right? Like, mm, yeah. I, okay, I don't want my kid to read it, but like, I, I don't want any child to ever have access to it. Wait, right. what? That's no, so weird. That's... Yeah. The funny thing is that it's not it's not just one side of the political spectrum, right? So we grew up during uh, the whole PMRC Tipper Gore thing, mm. right? And and cracking down on music mm -hmm. and the labels there. And it's like, they have the same ideas as people on the far right about controlling mm -hmm. what people should be exposed to. Yeah. Like it, it's not, it's not one side or the other. I really want to get into the brains of these people and dissect, like, what are you thinking? Right. How it's almost like, it's you? almost like a spectrum yeah. there, right? Like if it's a circle, I'm drawing a circle in the air for yes, those of our listening, podcast for listeners. Our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it's a circle, then, then that, that instinct can spiral, right? It, whether it's for, you know, whichever side of the ideological spectrum you're on, that, that urge to 
prevent other people from being exposed to media or stories that you're uncomfortable with, it's just a really terrible urge, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, yeah. if you're a parent, you have some control over what your child is, you know, reads, but also your child has some rights in terms of like, Mom oh, would hope, you know, right? like, oh, well, that's too scary. I'm not going to read that, right? Or I, I'm interested in that. It's like this delicate balance. And I think that, you know, when you become a parent, you you have the right to sort of figure out that balance for your own family, mm -hmm. but you don't have the right to do it for anybody else's. Kid. Absolutely. That's just, yeah. that's just obnoxious. It's obnoxious <laughs> and it's really confusing to me, you know? Oh, 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 Elizabeth Warren. Mm. She was oh, are giving- we political? You Am know I, what, we're just a fault? little bit, just a little bit. I think that's okay. I say that because it's my podcast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so someone asked her, you know, how do you feel? He said, you know, if someone comes to you and says, I think that marriage should be between a man and a woman, what is your response to that? You know, and she says, well, first of all, I would assume that it's a man asking. And number two, if you want to marry a woman, then you should do that. You just go right on ahead and do that. That's awesome, great. Right? Good for you. You know, you don't believe in gay marriage. Don't get gay married. Don't get gay married. <laughs> exactly. It's so simple. You know, it's like you want. Well, and then she said, if you can find someone. Ah, she, did. Nice. she did. And I was, I, I actually watched the clip like five <laughs> times in a row because it just gave me so much glee. Why is it something that has so much common sense? You know, be who you're going to be, be a good person, live your life and just try and love others. And if you don't want to marry a man or a woman, don't, right? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's that, um, it's like lessons from yoga. I could do a podcast. I like uh, that. Eyes, Say it in the voice. Eyes, <laughs> eyes on your own mat. Right? Like, <laughs> like I don't understand how other, I mean, and this was really like, I truly had, I struggled with this during the whole debate about same sex marriage. Like, how does my being able to marry my husband de devalue someone else's, someone else's relationship? Yeah. Like, and they really felt it did. Mm -hmm. And, and it was just sort of like, I don't know. I, I think that goes back to that idea of um, the sort of scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. And that if, you know, if, if somebody else has it, that means that I'm missing out. And I think that's, I mean, that's, I think that's the, the culture of, of, selfishness that we have ruling our country right now mm -hmm. is a lot of people hoarding power and wanting to make sure that other people don't have it because they feel that that will take it away from them it it's so oh it's, it's so confusing for me it's very yeah it's short-sighted it's confusing thanks ian rand <laughs> <laughs> oh really because that's gonna the last go there, thing huh? you need is, is somebody <laughs> writing a book telling already selfish individuals to be more selfish to be more selfish yeah <laughs> oh, but but you know the selfishness will trickle down and then when oh. <laughs> everybody's selfish we'll all be doing great yeah really. no but we'll all be living in our own little you know bomb shelters right exactly right? Like, it's terrible it's a it's terrible you know so going back to the books that you've been writing i i happen to know that you're writing a couple other books. oh going back to me okay yeah we want to go back to lee <laughs> Sure. Okay. Tell so. Tell us. Yeah, you have two more books that are coming out this year. Um, I have. Uh, so, I have the nonfiction book coming out in May 2021, and then I have two other books that are. Um, they are deals, but they're not contracts yet. So I'm not okay. So you can't to talk, talk about, about them. them. Okay. So. Well, can I ask you a different Ooh, question yeah, then? Yeah. Go for that it. I think some of our, our listeners would be interested in. Tell us about your process and finding an agent. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> one so, that's not a shyster, right? So, right? so allegedly, actually... I don't want to get sued. <laughs> so after the, after the criminal agent was exposed, um, I want to know about that too. I want to know how that person was exposed. How does that uh, even well, happen? Well, because someone got it, they got caught um, okay. because, uh, there was a had, whistleblower. They had told somebody that they had a book deal and then that person was like, well, where's my contract? And the, and then it ended up that that client said, well, if I don't get a contract eventually, I'm going to leave you. And they did leave the agent and then they got a new agent and that new agent contacted that editor and was like, yo, what's up? And the editor's like, I don't know what you're I talking about. Know. What wow. you mean? And then okay. it all blew up. Gotcha. So. 
But, wow. But it's interesting because I, I think back and I thought there I were- I feel like there's a book in there somewhere. Oh, not by me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to relive that I experience. Live that. That you, could have, you could have like a- uh, an anthology where all of the people who got screwed <laughs> totally. by this agent, but it would be chapter. so depressing. And like, it is kind of a point? depressing. And like, yeah. and, and like, what the, the thematic through line would be? Well, I don't think it should trust end in a anyone. <laughs> it's a fiction book. <laughs> well, the publishing industry is actually really exciting. There's a lot of crazy stuff that happens. Uh, but you don't want to be. You you want crazy in your fiction. You don't really want crazy in you your do. life. That's true. Like I want to I want to sequester all the crazy to my fiction to my that's, character. That's yeah. my goal. Yeah. Right. Like I would like a very placid, Good luck. lovely. Yeah. Exactly. So but, so your current. So, yeah. Yeah. So so afterwards, um, you know, it's funny because especially in the world of children's and teen, which is sort of the world that I I the waters I swim in. There are so many really nice and really talented and lovely agents. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are like, oh, I want to find an agent that I like and that I can be friends with. Right. Um, which is great, but you could be friends with a whole lot of people. Yeah. And I think the challenge is finding that agent that believes in what you're writing mm -hmm. and is passionate about what you're writing and believes that they can sell what you're writing. So you know, I write fiction, I write nonfiction, I write picture books, I write middle grade, I write YA. I wrote a lot of things. So for me, it was trying to find an agent that believed in me as an author across all those categories. Um, and then um, I did a series of interviews on my blog uh, about, so there's a lot of talk about like own voices and diversity and we need diverse books, especially in the world of children's and how important it is to have more diversity. Uh, but the conversation is often, um, it's often very, I don't know, it's like reduced down to like, yes, more diversity is important. We should have that. Mm. And then they move on to the next thing. And it's very, it's a very, uh, superficial conversation yeah so i wanted to have more in-depth conversations with agents about well okay you say you want diversity so tell us what are the books that are diverse that you really love that you wished you had repped or what exactly is your motivation like why do you care about diversity if you're a white woman like mm. like tell us more and let's really get into it so i did a series of like 25 interviews on my blog about, uh, with, with agents. And Marietta was, uh, one of the first that reached out to me and oh, said, I hear you doing this series. I really want to be interviewed for it. And I cool. was like, all right. And in it, she, um, she had a, uh, a, a response that was, um, if you have a story to tell and you do so from the heart, you will find your champions. I was really moved by that. And I actually repeated it back. I literally typed it back out. And I was like, make sure you, you know, get it right. I was like, wow, you know, if mm. you have a story to tell and you do so from the heart, you will find your champions. If I had that on a t-shirt, I would totally wear it. And, and I went on and asked more things. And and then two weeks later in the mail, I get a package and it's a t-shirt oh. with that quote <laughs> on it. And with my blog, um, you know, at leewin.org on the back of the wow, t-shirt. Wow, that's incredible. And I, I was with the criminal agent at the time. I, Marietta was not my agent, but fast forward all these years and now she is my now agent. Now she is. And I think that that was, it was sort of kismet. It was meant that to be. That was totally kismet. What a beautiful story. Yeah, well, out of, out of, out of the ashes of ridiculousness, the phoenix has risen. <laughs> Always, oh, yeah, crazy. yeah. So do you sell those t-shirts on your website? Because I kind of feel like you should. <laughs> well, it's Marietta's quote, I'll have to ask her. Or at least yeah. notebooks, right. I don't know. You guys can partner on oh, this. Yeah. There you go, an ancillary business, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Teespring will we'll help you out, go a long way. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, you had asked about writing and I wanted to just share something uh, that really, because I know you're a writer too. Mm -hmm. And um, Chad, are you a writer as well? I am not. You do the art stuff. I do photography and, and you know, that sort of thing. The audio here. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's storytelling in the images too, right? That's the old uh, yeah. idea. Where a picture yeah. tells a thousand words or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I think storytelling can happen in every form. It doesn't have to be words on the page. It can happen through photography. I mean, there's so many different God, Even a mediums. podcast, huh? Yeah, even podcasting <laughs> is storytelling. That's Absolutely. crazy. Well, and, and my favorite photographers are really the ones who are trying to Telling tell a, a story, story, whether it be whether they be war photographers or street photographers or mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. have you. 
Yeah, and the visual is, you know, tells a beautiful story too, because I think of what we get from it is so individual. You know, it's so subjective. I think that's why books and novels have such impact because as the reader, you're creating the, the scene visuals in, in your the head. visuals in your mind. You're, like, you're yeah. the art director. You're mm-hmm. the you're the director of cinematography. Or that's whatever right. They call it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the costume designer. Like you're doing it all, right? Like right. You're, you're building it all in your mind, which is so exciting. And you have to give your, the, your readers the benefit of the doubt of the doubt that they're going to do that. And they will fill in those blanks. We don't have to describe everything in great detail because it takes them out of the story. Right. This is why I only read YA pretty much. I, really? Yeah, I, I find that the, the, the level of description and the pace of a lot of adult books make me just you know, uninterested. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a couple of your favorite YA books? Yeah, I'm um, actually, uh, so Carry On by Rainbow Rowell. Uh, it was sort of the gay Harry Potter book I wished we had had from mm-hmm. J.K. Rowling, but we didn't. We got it from, from Rainbow Rowell. Um, that's really, that was amazing. It was so fun. And um, I really like fantasy. It's a, it's, a, it's a genre I really enjoy reading. I haven't mastered writing it yet. But um, so there's a new book out by Rainbow that I actually um, just downloaded to my phone uh, this morning because cool. I'm going to listen to it on the okay. drive home and it's called wayward son and it's the the sequel to that so i'm, nice. I'm excited about that cool and um yeah and then i actually read uh i read my first gay romance book recently mm. i'm listening to a lot of different genres trying to trying to change it up and it was called the doctor's secret by heidi cullinan and Ooh. it was yeah really it fun. sounds good yeah, well, the secret clearly was like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> not much of a secret there <laughs> but um but but it's interesting because people love romance i mean mm-hmm. romance is such a huge category it and, really is and there's um heather graham graham who spoke last night at this conference that we were both at um she was talking about how her romance readers followed her when she started moving across she categories to different genres hmm. yeah and um they're they're just amazing. And I wanted to try to understand a little more, like, well, what is well, it about romance? Well, let's, let's think about it for a minute. Think of a book that doesn't have some sort of romance, some level of romance in it. Mm. I mean, most books do. I mean, even yeah. if you think about Indiana Jones, he had a romantic love interest, right? Yeah. So I think maybe it just... It, but but Does, romance in speci- romance in particular has this thing where you know it's going to be a happy ending. Mm, that's true. You know they're going to end up okay. Mm. And mm-hmm. I think that gives you a sense it gives readers a sense of safety <laughs> mm-hmm. in letting themselves invest emotionally in the story they know it's going to end well right because you don't in real life right you don't True. know how things yeah. are going to end in real life but if you're reading a romance you know for sure it's going to be a happy ending maybe you don't know how it's going to turn how it's going to get there and maybe that's the fun he's gonna of it. get the boy we know gonna, it's gonna happen <laughs> and it was there was a level of i just i had so much fun with it and mm-hmm. i was so surprised so that was really interesting that's interesting me. i've never you know i've never read a romance novel well, there you go we throw down the gauntlet here yeah you go. i'm gonna have to read a romance <laughs> novel but i did i looked up heather graham and i realized she writes thrillers but they always have a romantic there's a romance involved so she brought that from her romance writing days with harlequin yeah and i think that you know having those romantic subplots there i think it keeps it interesting what? it keeps it real i don't know yeah. i mean it's that sort of interior exterior thing like mm-hmm. there needs to be some exterior action happening please and then, and some, then some subplot. But happening. there has to be some interior, you know, journey too for the character. And, yeah. You know how how will we get invested in that character if they don't have those deeper emotions? If they're just falling out of a plane, right? Just falling out of a plane. <laughs> Although Bond never had any romance. I mean, let's be no, real. No, actually, it's not. He, Did he got married true. once. He Did got, he really? In, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so George Lazenby. Secret Service. Yeah. Okay. George Lazenby had a very short one film career. <laughs> and sorry, I'm a little obsessed with Bond. Do it. Yeah, I love it. Because I'm actually, that's the one of the books I'm, I'm working on um, is a sort of teen who is obsessed with James Bond. So mm-hmm. I've been doing a lot of James Bond um cribbing which is really fun because it's 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 a really it's something i love um but he basically comes to discover that james bond is a terrible role model mm, um yeah, yeah uh, right manipulative about sex and just you know <laughs> violence right. is the solution to everything and total womanizer oh just terrible but it's also really fun and mm-hmm. you know so trying to figure out how to write an action adventure about a gay teen who's obsessed with james bond 
Um, I'm having a, a really great time with it. But anyway, George Lazenby uh, played James yeah. Bond in this film. And at the very end of it, and he spoiler cries. Spoiler alert, he cries. And that is why they had to go back to Sean Connery <laughs> because our culture couldn't quite take James Bond, a having, Bond. having any emotions at all. And that's why he is sort of like, and now, you know, in the, in the Casino Royale with, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank on his the name. The new one or the old? The new one. Oh, yeah, the new one. Uh, Daniel Craig. Daniel, Daniel Craig, Craig. Yeah, you know who's gorgeous. Love him. And, oh my yeah. god. Yeah. But like he's being tortured and he laughs. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that is how far they had to go from George Lazenby sobbing over Tracy's dead body at the end of <laughs> Her Majesty's <laughs> Secret Service. Sorry, spoiler alert. Yeah, you know? yeah. But yeah, but that's how far they had to go because, like, gosh, they couldn't have. I mean. You wouldn't want any, what does that any, say? any male children thinking they could cry. It's okay and, to cry but, and have emotions or feelings. She's dead. Over it's the okay death of to a cry. Woman. Right. Yeah. The, oh, it makes me crazy. <sighs> yeah, right? We could go back down that, but we won't. Yeah, we won't. But instead, let's talk a little bit about your writing schedule and how you find time to write. Because I know you, well, you've already listed like all of these things you do. Yeah. So... I have to give a shout out to uh, Linda Sue Park. So Linda Sue is an author who does middle grade and she won the Newbery Award and she's brilliant and a, a lovely person and really shares her expertise. And uh, at a Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators conference, she talked about how she does, she does a version of the Pomodoro method. So Pomodoro is the Italian word for tomato, but it's also the kitchen timers, I guess in Italy look like mm, tomatoes. Yeah. So, and they're 24 minutes long. Mm. and. Um, she does a, a version of that. So she calls them writing sprints. And so she sets her cell phone timer to 12 minutes and she uh, tells herself, I only need to focus for 12 minutes. Of course she goes longer. And then she sets a timer and she sits down and she starts writing. And if she's able to, when the timer goes off, if she's in the flow and she doesn't have any other responsibilities, she hits the timer again and she does another 12 minutes. And mm -hmm. she said, that the most she's ever done in a row since this new phase of her life where she's helping take care of her grandchildren and stuff um, is five. Well, for those of you math five whizzes increments. out there, five <laughs> times 12 is 60. This is one hour. And it really blew my mind because I always told myself, oh, I need like a three or four hour chunk of time to get any real serious writing work done. But I kind of felt like this was a breakthrough in, mm. in terms of approach. And I thought, well, I can take 12 minutes right. to write. I can take 12 minutes any day. Like I can find 12 minutes. I can minutes. do 12 minutes, I, yeah. I have no interior <laughs> resistance to 12 minutes. Like if you mm -hmm. said, Lee, can you sit down for 12 and a half minutes? I'd be like, no, you know, that's too long. <laughs> I don't think I can do it. I don't yeah. have 12 and a half minutes. But amazingly enough, um, for some reason for me, and I guess for Linda Sue, um, there's some, that, that internal resistance does not exist to that number. Mm. Like I literally can get back. It can be 9.30 at night from an entire day of work and commuting and another event in the evening. And I can get home and I can be like, oh, Oh man, I never wrote today. And I will sit and write for 12 for minutes. For 12 minutes. Because what happens is because I'm doing it every day, I never fall out of the story. It's always right mm. That's there. That's really right? critical. Because it used yeah. to take me a really long time. I'd have to read the first 10, ten, the ten pages yeah, the, before it. Like, yeah. Where was I? What was I doing? What was the character mm. doing? But I go back and within two minutes, I'm back in the flow. Wow. Um, and, you know, many days I am able to do more than 12 minutes, but some days that's it. I, mm. I get 12 minutes, but I make sure I get it. And, nice. Um, Is it I, a specific time or? No, it's whenever I can do it. If I try to do it before work because that's sort of like my, my best brain. <laughs> can kind of kind of give it to my book um mm -hmm. but sometimes i just run out of time and it doesn't happen in the morning um depending on what other things are going on mm -hmm. so yeah but but uh, like i did it this morning when i when i got up nice and do you type your story or do you hand write with a pen handwrite oh i i i well i guess i do i have a journal a blank journal for every book mm -hmm. and it's sort of the, i guess the the bible for that story and I generally have that with me mm -hmm. because there's a lot of, I don't know, I write complicated stories with timelines and I have to draw out sketches of the where the characters live. So I know, are they turning left? Are they turning right? What are they doing? Where are mm. they going? 
nice. you know, where's the subway, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I need to have that somewhere. I can't have it live at the bottom of the, of the manuscript. Mm-hmm. I tried Scrivener, but it didn't really work for me. It was, okay. it was too many ancillary things. Right. And I kind of want to write in a word document. So I'm, I'm actually creating what is ultimately going to be the thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I well, guess I do. The person doing your layout thanks you. Yeah. Uh, for using Word, not Scrivener. Scrivener is a real problem for, for layout. <laughs> really exporting Scriveners. Yeah, They're, it always exports funky. Yeah, yeah. I, I know people that love it, and I really, really I tried. but um, Despite yeah. the fact that we're book designers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it is amazing that you're able to like have galleries of images that inspire you. And I, I, I like a lot of the bells and whistles of it. I just find that for me... I can go I can go down the rabbit hole with that kind of stuff and I can spend a lot of time on stuff that doesn't actually impact the story because I'm like mm-hmm. I'm world building. I don't know anything about <laughs> right? that. Yeah. yeah. So I don't I, <laughs> I've tried to kind of be more like, okay, I'm working on chapter twelve today. What do I need to accomplish in chapter twelve? And I'm very plot uh, uh, driven falling out of an airplane that 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 works for me i want to write that scene so i have to really work and make sure that it's a real character falling out of the plane and mm. why do we care that he's falling out of right, a plane right right so that stuff that's cool well i have to say i'm so glad that we had you on today thank you so much for sharing your story i think it's a really important story and i'm excited to see it out in the world Thank you. Tell Thanks. us again. This has been really fun. When it's going to be available. Tell, well, tell us about the book that's currently available, your fiction, okay, where so we can get it. Queer is a $5 bill. Available everywhere books are sold. sold, sold. <laughs> um, there's actually an audio book too. Oh, um, awesome. So Did I, you read your own audio book? Oh, hell no. Oh, oh. no. Actually, I, Thank you. I, <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I like your voice. I'm just saying. No, I was going to say. It's I always you, so I'm weird not an when actor. people... I mean, I think yeah, if it you was a memoir, a I mean, like, you should read the audiobook of your memoir. Like, that I get. I mean, like, I can also see the argument against it. Um, right. But, like, you, I need think you, need to be to be, an, you need to be an actor to do it. A and voice it's talent. Hard. Yeah. It's hard to yeah. do it. I mean, I really struggled just doing the author's note. And I was, like, determined to read the author's note mm-hmm. right, myself. But, no, we hired. Um, so, I always say with book marketing, here's a book marketing tip. Uh, you close your eyes and you imagine your book on the shelf of your ideal reader yep. and face out, right? Cause it's your, it's right. your book, <laughs> it's, your, it's your fantasy, make it face out. <laughs> there are gonna be books on either side of your book that your ideal reader loves because they love your genre, they love what you're writing and they love these other books too. Um, and they should be recent books like in the last two years, books that have done really well. So those can be like your comp titles and you can look and sort of reverse engineer, what did they do? Where did they get, who blurbed those books? What awards did they go for? Mm-hmm. Who reviewed those books? Mm-hmm. That can be super useful for you. So um, in playing this game, uh, when my book was coming out, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda by Becky, Ab- Becky Albertalli was a really, really successful YA gay teen book. And there was a movie, Love, Simon. It was very much in the moment. And the narrator of that audiobook um, is the, guy i hired to do the audiobook awesome. for queers a five dollar bill nice how can i uh, what, it's, that? i mean it's that's that's great because you've got a match for for someone who's already you know done the reading in that genre yeah i remember one of the strangest audiobooks i ever heard was ray Liotta reading the art of war hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound strange <laughs> oh because every every chapter starts with you know the sun Tzu says but it was like this overly like gangster sort of sun Tzu says <laughs> like, this isn't working yeah, you're, man <laughs> the audio voice matters oh yeah so sure. michael crouch is the name of the uh, narrator and he's brilliant and nice. he does such a good job and he and, probably had a following from the first book if people like him they're well, liable to find his next book and that is i didn't even know yeah, but it talent. turns out people follow Absolutely. audiobook narrators mm-hmm. like they actually will search on michael crouch and be like what else has this guy done because he's great because he's great and i really Oh, right. like yeah and i didn't know that that even existed did totally. he do did he do voices for characters or is he just kind of like no, yeah he, he did it was amazing it was truly amazing i i just i don't even know how, and i never even so met he him. did do voices he so did, he, he did voices he, he went into like, character it was for, astonishing wow and i never even met him like the whole thing was done like over email with the people that produced the audiobook it was, it was so crazy very cool 
So Very anyway, cool. Michael, if you're out there, you did an amazing job. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, so so that's the novel that's out. Um, the nonfiction book uh, will be coming out from Learner in May of 2021. It also will be available everywhere. Books are sold, sold, sold. Well, and what's tell us your website so sure, people can go on and get more information and subscribe to your newsletter, which is fantastic. Oh, I you. love that you were doing video newsletters with updates on like what's happening. It's really exciting. It's fast paced. So I highly recommend it. Thank to you. And, I, and I've made a promise to myself, and I guess to everybody. Else. I'm going to make a promise now. They will always be under five minutes. Okay. That's month, a good promise. The monthly uh, video newsletters. That's a nice amount of time. I just, so what's your URL? Uh, LeeWind.org. There you go. L-E-E-W-I-N-D dot O-R-G. That rhymes. That's actually interesting. I know. I kind of like it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We should put it on a t-shirt. I guess I'll keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything else that, that you'd like to add or share with our listener? I mean, specifically about, you know, finding books that resonate with you and, you know, books that are important to you and in, in your growth as a human. Librarians are your friend. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Be kind to them. Um, talk up books that you like. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it's always review sort books of, you like on Amazon so yeah. other people find them. I asked a question at the conference yesterday. I said, okay, so you know, we all want people to review your books, but what's the last book you reviewed? It's a great question. And where did you review it? Yeah. I think uh, it's it's Yeah, review books. Yeah, review books if you like them. I yeah. mean if you hate them, yeah. just move on. Just move on. Yeah, we don't need those bad reviews. No, I think that's really that's really important. Yeah. yeah, thank you for saying that. And and I think also, you know, be brave enough to try something different mm. and you read a little bit outside of your wheelhouse. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to read a romance novel. Lee. There you go. Yeah, yeah I'm going to do it. <laughs> awesome. I'm so grateful. Thank you both for having this opportunity to be on your thanks, podcast. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for making stopping the tri by. long trip out here. We appreciate it. Uh, well, it was it's 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 really an honor. Are you an author with a story to tell, but you're just not sure how to get that story out? Guess what? You don't have to do it alone. Marnie Friedman is an incredible writing coach. She offers personalized support and expertise to guide you from a kernel of an idea to completion. Visit MarniFriedman.com to learn more. That's M-A-R-N-I-F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N.com. This episode is brought to you by Monkey C Media, a small boutique design firm offering award-winning websites, book cover designs, book trailers, and photography services. And full disclosure, we love what we do. Chad and I founded Monkey C Media in 2004, and we're still going strong. Visit monkeycmedia.com. That's M-O-N-K-E-Y, the letter C, media.com to see how we can help you promote your book, build a powerful online presence mm -hmm. what else you got chad uh let's see we've got the san diego writer festival san diego writers festival there That's are many writers <laughs> and they're a proud sponsor of our premise podcast as well mm -hmm. and it's gonna be awesome this year's keynote is scott gimple he's the head writer of the walking dead and the festival is free it's open to the public there's going to be educational panels and workshops famous authors up and coming authors, kids and teen programming, and live theater performances. Oh, and there's music. Oh, and there's food. Oh, but wait, there's more. You also get a copy of our home game. Oh, um, you're silly. But wait, there is more. There will be literary agents taking pitches from authors looking to get their books published. The festival is about building community and celebrating storytelling of all kinds. It's happening April 4th, 2020, at the Coronado Public Library. 